By early 1943, the Japanese Empire was at its height. The country had occupied Malaya and Burma, the Philippines, and the Dutch East Indies, Indonesia today. These territories had become vital sources of strategic supplies such as oil and rubber. Now the United States laid plans to roll back the Japanese gains. The aim was to cut the country's supply lines by seizing the occupied territories. Japan would then be gradually strangled to death. But to win in the vast expanse of the Pacific, the US would need to develop new forms of mobile warfare. They would be based on amphibious landings supported by aircraft flying from carriers. The Japanese, unable to match American firepower, resorted to increasingly desperate measures. The country fell back on ancient notions of military honor create suicide units. The result would be a terrible loss of life. This would be a decisive phase in the war in the Pacific and would mark the end of Japan's dreams of empire. But this was to come. Back in the spring of 1943, the US military chiefs faced a dilemma. They had been presented with two options for the defeat of Japan. The flamboyant US Army General Douglas MacArthur, commander of the US and Australian forces in the Southwest Pacific, favored a primary land-based route. His idea was to seize the Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, and the Philippines. They could then be turned into a strategic barrier that would cut off Japan from its newly conquered lands in Burma, Malaya, and the Dutch East Indies. Japan would be starved into surrender. Equally importantly, this plan would mean MacArthur could repay a debt. Earlier in the war, he had been kicked out of the Philippines by the Japanese, and he had promised to return to liberate the country. But the US Navy had a different idea. It would bypass the heavily defended Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, and the Philippines. Instead, it would seize a string of much smaller islands scattered across the Central Pacific and close to the Japanese homeland. Rather than a barrier, the US would have a series of strategic bases from which to attack Japan's supply lines. They argued it would be swifter and much more economic. The American military command put off the decision. Both the Army and Navy were told to go ahead. In June 1943, MacArthur's plan was launched. It was called Operation Cartwheel. The first target was the major Japanese military base at Rabaul on New Britain in the Solomon Islands. It would be a two-pronged attack. The eastern prong fought its way up through New Georgia and Bougainville. 
western prong battled its way through Papua New Guinea. But the virtually impenetrable jungle and unhealthy climate made progress slow. It was nearly nine months before the pincers met and the Japanese base at Rabaul was isolated. Meanwhile, as the US Army took control of the Solomon Islands, the US Navy mustered a mighty fleet. It included the first four of the brand new Essex-class aircraft carriers. They were bigger and faster than anything before. The new carriers were equipped with outstanding new planes like the Hellcat and Corsair fighters, Hell Diver dive bombers, and Avenger torpedo bombers. Together, they both outperformed and outnumbered their Japanese opponents. The Navy's first targets were the Japanese garrisons on the coral atolls of Tarawa and Makin in the Gilbert Islands. These were close to some of the most important supply routes across the Pacific. For a week, the atolls were bombed by carrier-based aircraft. November the 20th, 1943, there was an amphibious landing. Making was captured with little difficulty. The Tarot was a different story. Reconnaissance had failed to reveal that the water was too shallow for the landing craft. As the Marines waded ashore, they came under intense fire. The island was honeycombed with fortified machine gun nests. Troops who made it to dry land were pinned down on the beach. By the end of the day, over 1,500 of the 5,000 US Marines landed had been killed or severely injured. Over the next two days, frontal assaults pushed the Japanese back inch by inch. Very often, only flamethrowers could eliminate the Japanese strongholds. It took three days before the last pocket of Japanese resistance was wiped out. Of the 4,200 Japanese troops on the island, only 17 were captured alive. Tarawa was a terrible forerunner of what was to come. The Japanese had shown that there would be no question of surrender. They would fight to the death. It was a grim prospect. 
In January 1944, America's naval offensive in the Pacific moved on to the Marshall Islands. Admiral Chester Nimitz, the US naval commander in the Central Pacific, was anxious to avoid another bloodbath. So, aircraft from his carrier force bombed Japanese airfields on the islands for nearly two months. Finally, on February the 1st, 1944, he sent in the assault forces. The flat and open island of Roy was quickly overrun. The islands of Kwajalein and Namur were wooded, and the Japanese resisted fanatically. US forces used flamethrowers and explosives. Japanese responded by launching suicidal Banzai charges. The US forces now knew what to expect. The Japanese were beaten back. Over 8,000 Japanese soldiers died for the loss of less than 400 US lives. Atoll after atoll in the Marshall Islands now fell to the US advance. Kwajalein was followed by Inuitu. The island of Truk was bypassed and cut off though a small Japanese garrison would remain undefeated until the end of the war. The way was now clear for the next push, a thousand miles west towards the Mariana Islands. If captured, the islands would put the Japanese mainland within range of US heavy bombs. also enable America to block Japan's supply lines from Southeast Asia. On June 11, 1944, the US started to soften up the three main islands in the Marianas. Four days later, Marines stormed the beaches of the northerly island of Saipan. This time, the terrain was mountains with many caves, and the preliminary bombardment had not disrupted the Japanese defenses as much as had been hoped. Nevertheless, by the end of the day, the American bridgehead was secure. In Tokyo, the news caused mounting alarm. The Japanese high command now sent a carrier fleet to rescue the situation and save the Marianas. But the task force was spotted by US submarines. The Americans sent their main carrier force to intercept the Japanese. June the 19th, 1944, 
the Japanese launched airstrikes against the US ships. But US radar saw them coming. Four hundred and fifty fighters were scrambled to intercept the Japanese planes. It turned into the largest aircraft carrier battle ever fought. The US task force had 15 aircraft carriers and more than 900 aircraft. Against it, the Japanese had nine carriers and nearly 500 aircraft. But Japan had lost many of its experienced air crews during the Solomon and Marshall Islands campaigns. Its novice pilots faced battle-hardened U.S. flights. The Japanese were outgunned and outfought. go down in history as the great Marianas Turkish. Half an hour into the battle, a torpedo from a US submarine hit the newest and largest Japanese carrier, the Taiho, while she was still launching aircraft. The Battle of the Philippine Sea had claimed its first major victim. At around the same time, another US submarine torpedoed the carrier Shokak. She was completely destroyed. Nevertheless, the Japanese commander decided to continue with the operation hoping to stop further U.S. landings in the Marianas. For much of the following day, the U.S. forces tried to pin down the exact location of the remaining Japanese carriers. It took them until the afternoon to find them. It was late in the day to launch an attack, and the aircraft would have to fly at the limit of their range. But the US task force commander, Admiral Mark Mitcher, decided to gamble and attack. A third Japanese carrier, the Hayo, was hit and sunk. The Japanese had lost over 300 aircraft. But as the US planes now returned, dangerously short of fuel, they ran into a problem. In the gathering darkness, they couldn't find their own carriers. Many ran out of fuel and had to ditch in the sea. Mitchell in an act of extraordinary courage, ordered his carriers to switch on their lights to guide in the returning air. Fortunately for the Americans, there were no Japanese submarines to see them. Nevertheless, over 80 US planes were lost, either through having to ditch in the sea or through crashing while they landed. But Japanese losses had been even greater. Three carriers and most of the aircraft needed to equip its remaining carrier fleet were gone. From now on, the United States Navy would dominate the Pacific, striking when and where it wanted. 
The Japanese naval defeat in the Philippine Sea meant the United States could now press on with its assault on the Marianas. The Japanese forces on Saipan held out for three weeks before they were overcome on July the 9th, 1944. The final horror came when thousands of Japanese civilians were persuaded to jump to their deaths from the cliffs rather than be captured by the Americans. The last Japanese troops then launched their now inevitable suicide charge. Virtually the entire 32,000 strong garrison was killed. Over 3,000 Americans also died. Two weeks later, US Marines landed on the islands of Guam and Tinia, also in the Marianas. Once again, they faced suicidal Japanese counterattacks. But they failed to stop the American advance. The US Navy had seized the Marianas. Both the US Army and Navy offensives had now completed the first phase of their separate strategies to isolate Japan. The US military planners now had to make a choice. Should they continue to back MacArthur's strategy and move on to the capture of the Philippines? Or should they go with the naval plan and send a fleet across the Pacific to seize Taiwan or the Ryukyu Islands? The naval option would isolate Japan without the need for an almost certainly lengthy and bloody operation to take the Philippines. But at a meeting in Hawaii on July the 26th, 1944, MacArthur charmed President Roosevelt into backing his plan to liberate the Philippines. The Navy was instructed to support it before returning to its island hopping strategy. It was a decision that would cost a horrendous number of both military and civilian lives. The following month, US forces landed on the Philippine island of Leyte. They took the Japanese by surprise. They had expected the first US landing to be on the main island of Luzon. Within hours, MacArthur was striding ashore with press photographers in attendance. He later made a broadcast to the Philippine people. I see that the old flag staff still stands. Have your troops hoist the colors to its peak and let no enemy ever haul them down. But the Japanese soon recovered and launched an ambitious plan to use the remains of their naval power to counterattack. Operation Sho, meaning victory was typically complex. The main strength of the Japanese fleet was divided into two groups to form a pincer. One pincer would approach through the San Bernardino Straits and attack the US landing from the north. The second would come in through the Sodegao Straits and attack from the south. 
Meanwhile, a decoy group of Japan's last four carriers would approach the Philippines from the northeast, hoping to lure away the main U.S. carrier force covering the landing. The northern arm of the Japanese pincer came under air attack almost immediately. After nearly two days of bombardment, the super battleship Musashi was sunk. The northern pincer then appeared to retreat. It was now that the US commanders got into a muddle. The man in charge of the main carrier force covering the landings was Admiral William Bull Halsey. He now got word of the Japanese carriers approaching from the northeast. Halsey, believing the northern pincer was no longer a threat, set off to intercept them. He had fallen for the Japanese decoy. The force protecting the U.S. landing was now severely weakened. But the commander of this force now inadvertently compounded the problem. Unaware that Halsey had taken off, he sent his battleships to ambush the southern arm of the Japanese pincer. looked like a spectacular success. But then, disaster struck. The northern arm of the Japanese pincer had only pretended to retreat. Under cover of darkness, it turned round and headed back then attacked the hugely depleted force protecting the U.S. landing. Only a handful of small escort carriers and destroyers faced the Japanese super battleship Yamato and three other battleships. Now the turn of the Americans to put up a desperate fight. The Japanese tactic had caught the US aircraft unprepared. They were armed with high explosives for land operations rather than armor-piercing bombs for ships. Just as it seemed the Japanese must break through, they suddenly turned tail. Their commander had worried he was sailing into a trap. Meanwhile, to the north, Halsey's headlong rush to intercept the Japanese decoy force finally paid off. October the 25th, 1944, all four Japanese carriers were sunk. The Battle of Leyte Gulf had completely finished off Japan's once proud navy. There was now little hope of holding back the American advance. For Japan, it was time for desperate measures. The stage was set for a terrible climax to MacArthur's plan. By the autumn of 1944, 
The Allies had isolated the Japanese forces in the Philippines. Their naval support had been destroyed. Japan needed a new tactic if it was to hold back the American advance. The Japanese commander in the islands called for volunteers to join special units. They were called the kamikazes, or divine wind, and drew on the Japanese military code of honor that it was better to die than live as a coward. They were suicide. Units. On October the 25th, 1944, the first kamikaze unit took a final ceremonial drink before taking off. Its target was the US fleet. Escort carrier, St. Globe, is sunk, and two others badly damaged. Further kamikaze attacks followed. Not all were restricted to the air. Japanese troops now began strapping mines to their bodies and deliberately diving under US tanks. The American advance through the Philippine island of Leyte slowed. It would take two months before the island was finally secured. Over 70,000 Japanese troops had lost their lives. The Americans had lost nearly 16,000 men. But MacArthur was undaunted. He now moved on to the main Philippine island of Luzon. The defenses were, as usual, softened up by air attacks. The US troops went ashore virtually unopposed. But as they advanced, Japanese resistance stiffened. Tanks, artillery, mortars, and flamethrowers were used to destroy a succession of Japanese strongholds. Painfully, the US forces battled forward. By January the 23rd, 1945, they had reached the major air base of Clark Field, 60 miles from the capital, Manila. A week later, they were approaching the capital itself. Manila was famous for its architectural beauty. The Japanese regional commander had taken a decision to preserve its buildings by not defending it. But the junior Japanese garrison commander disobeyed orders and refused to withdraw his 20,000 troops pledged to defend Manila to the death. There now began a ferocious month-long battle to seize the Philippine capital. 
US troops fought their way into the city. At first, they too tried to preserve the major buildings. But as they ran into snipers, machine gun nests and hidden artillery, they were forced to reduce much of the city to run. By the end of February, the Japanese defenders had been driven back into the 16th century citadel of Intramuros. Another week of fierce fighting to flush them out. Finally, on April 13, 1945, US forces mounted an amphibious attack on Manila Bay's last fortification, Fort Drum, the concrete battleship in the harbor. Its ventilation shafts were packed with kerosene, white phosphorus, and explosives. None of the defenders survived. The battle for Manila had been a horrific affair. Thousands of Japanese and US soldiers had died. But the real horror was that some 100,000 civilians also lost their lives. Many massacred indiscriminately by the Japanese during the final days of fighting. Elsewhere in the Philippines, there were more than 50 U.S. landings on other smaller islands. But it would take until the end of the war before the last pockets of Japanese resistance were finally flushed out. MacArthur's conquest of the Philippines had proved as difficult and costly in lives as his critics had feared. It may also have been unnecessary. By now, US submarines had virtually cut off Japan from its supply lines, and the Navy was closing in on the homeland itself. The Japanese merchant fleet was particularly vulnerable. It was rarely organized into convoys, and anyway, there weren't enough escort vessels to protect them. By the end of 1944, so many Japanese merchant ships had been sunk the US Navy was having problems finding new targets. US submarines now moved in ever closer to the shores of the Japanese home islands. Japan was being starved of fuel, food, and raw materials. US Navy submarines in the Pacific had succeeded, where German U-boats in the Atlantic had failed in bringing an island nation close to defeat. But now, the US forces faced the daunting prospect of invading its fanatical enemy's homeland. 
by spring 1945, US forces were closing in on Japan from the south and east. But to the west, in China, Burma and India, a separate campaign had been unfolding. Japan had invaded China in 1937. The United States had regarded the Chinese leader, Chiang Kai-shek, as a Western ally and sent aid. Much of it went in through British-controlled Burma along the so-called Burma Road over the mountains to southern China. Then, in 1942, Japan invaded Burma and kicked out the British. The Burma Road was shut down. Six months later, Britain launched the first of a series of attacks to retake Burma and reopen the road. The first, in late 1942, advanced down the Burmese coast from India. But the Japanese crushed it. The second, nine months later, tried a different approach. Instead of sending in a conventional force, small groups of soldiers were infiltrated deep behind Japanese lines. They were known as chimneys, and were the brainchild of an unconventional officer called Ord Wingate. Their task was to destroy railway lines and disrupt Japanese communications. Chindis, that's the name for the guardian statues which stand at the steps of Burmese pagodas. A name from legend that's become flesh and blood, living guardians of Burma's liberty. But the Japanese soon began to hunt them down. mid-April 1943, over one-third of the Chindit forces had been killed. The remainder were forced back into India. The struggle to retake Burma was becoming a serious problem. So, in late 1943, the Allies turned to US General Joseph Stilwell. We got run out of Burma, and it's humiliating as hell. I think we ought to find out what caused it, go back and retake the place. Stilwell had spent years helping to overhaul the forces of neighboring China. The Allies now decided to put them to the test. Stilwell's Chinese soldiers, reinforced by an elite US group of jungle fighters known as Merrill's Marauders, would be sent into Burma. In October 1943, they crossed the border and made their way down the east side of the country. Meanwhile, the British India Army launched a diversionary strike along the Burmese coast. Finally, Chindits moved into northern Burma, deep behind enemy lines to cut Japanese supply routes. The Japanese fell for the diversionary tactic and sent forces to counterattack along the coast. Two divisions of troops from British India came under fierce fire. 
Allied forces stood their ground. They were resupplied from the air. They could now fight back, and two weeks later, the Japanese withdrew. But it was only a temporary reprieve. The Japanese launched a counter-offensive of their own. In March 1944, they invaded India in an attempt to disrupt Allied preparations for further attacks. For two weeks, there was intense fighting. The towns of Kohima and Imphal were besieged. But there was stiff resistance, and the Japanese were finally forced to withdraw. Over 65,000 of them were killed. It was a major blow to their military strength in the region. Meanwhile, in Burma, Stilwell's Chinese forces had fought their way down the east side of the country, and by May 1944, had reached the important crossroads town of Michigan on the old Burma Road. For three months, the Japanese held them off. But in early August 1944, Michina was overrun. The way was now clear for Stilwell's men to push further on down the east side of the country. They were soon joined by a fresh force of Anglo-Indian troops under British General William Slip. This began advancing into the center of the country. In early March 1945, Slim's forces took the important communications center of Mechtila. Soon afterwards, they seized Mandalay. With the monsoon season now approaching, Stilwell's forces dug in on the east. but Slim's forces pushed on towards the Burmese capital of Rangoon. They were slowed down by the rain. But by early May 1945, the Allied troops were 20 miles north of Rangoon. Allied reinforcements were now sent in from the south to support them. Gurkhas parachuted into the Irrawaddy Delta. An Indian division came in by sea. On May the 3rd, 1945, the Allied forces finally entered Rangoon. But the city was empty. The Japanese had pulled out rather than risk being cut off. The monsoon was now in full flow. But the campaign to clear the Japanese out of Burma was effectively over. The next stop in the war in Southeast Asia would be Malaya. But for all the success, Allied losses in the war against the Japanese had been terrible. The Americans were desperate to find a way to bring the war to an end without having to invade the Japanese home. 